Right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. I'll talk a bit about um, kernel ABI specification, uh, how everyone wants one, but how hard it is to get one. Uh, so what's an ABI? ABI is really how uh, two binary pieces of code would communicate with each other. And in our case, with uh, the kernel, it would describe how the user space would talk with the kernel. Um, basically, this is what we all know as system calls, IOCTLs, and to some extent VDSO, which is also a way for user space to get into the kernel. Um, so cover a bit about how it works right now, what's the current process of getting new, uh, new ABI, um, or, uh, and wh what are the requirements of existing ABI changes. Uh, so the first thing is, as Greg stated yesterday, we can't break the ABI. It's the only thing you'll get yelled for, and no patch is allowed to break the ABI, intentionally at least. Um, the problem is that we don't have enough tools in place to catch this breakage in time. So usually the one to complain about this breakage is the user who is supposed to have a working system. So we'd release a kernel, and a few weeks later, someone shows up on LKML and says, hey, um, my program broke and now it crashes. What do you do? And we'll go and fix it. Uh, this is a bit tricky because on one hand, we promise to never break this thing, and this is our single golden rule, but we do this pretty often. Um, so how does new ABI get in, which um, may explain why that happens. So usually someone decides we need to get a new ABI, a new system call, a new octal. Um, a recent example will probably be a uh, user fault of D, Andrea wrote um, a couple years back. Um, so we decided we'll need user fault of D in the kernel. Uh, you wrote the kernel side of, of that. And someone else, I think it was David Gilbert, uh, wrote the QM counterpart just to show how it works nicely together. Um, and they both worked a bit before it went upstream. Uh, each fixed stuff on his own end. And then uh, once everything was ready and QMU was working great with the patched kernel, uh, the kernel patches went in the kernel and the QMU patches went into QMU and everyone were happy. And then as time goes by, we slowly fix stuff that we found are broken. So we may patch the kernel side a bit if we, if we find something broken, or we may patch QM if we find something broken, and we just keep doing that forever and ever. Uh, what doesn't work about this? The problem is with, with API, there's nothing that says what sort of things you're supposed to check for, uh, what sort of uh, parameters it can accept, what sort of checks you need to do on those parameters. Um, Another recent example for that was uh, about a year ago, uh, a syscall named copy file range was introduced. It's pretty simple. It takes a range of bytes from one file descriptor and copies it to a second file descriptor, similar to what send file does. Uh, so a year after copy file range was introduced, someone wanted to see what happens if you pass a directory descriptor to it. And the results were very interesting. Um, and a check w was added to copy file range to prevent that behavior. But originally when the uh, system, system call was added, the author didn't know what he should check for, what he shouldn't check for. It was, he could look at other system calls for reference, but that doesn't guarantee anything. Another thing is that um, you can't really sure what, system call, what each system call does exactly. And a good example is uh, the open sys call. So what would happen if I pass the O directory flag and the O create flag? Would it create a directory or would it fail because the directory doesn't exist? Uh, um, this would mean that uh, in the future someone could rely on a given behavior. So right now if open would create a directory, it might change in five years. Someone changes a small thing, doesn't know this. It breaks and it breaks programs. But that's not good. There's no way to verify what things do now and what they don't. Uh, we do have tools like LTP that check uh, and try to make sure we don't break something too big, but they're very limited by their scope and they don't check. The, their coverage is very small and it's really not enough. Uh, the only thing that really checks that we didn't break anything is the actual users and their user space applications that end up breaking at the end. Um, and this is a problem for us because it's usually it's detected after we release the kernel. So we have a kernel that's broken in a while we may fix it a version later, but something else might start depending on the, on the behavior of a broken kernel. And then it becomes even trickier to fix. Um, so it's, it's a bad thing to allow this sort of thing to happen. Um, yeah, so as I said before, there's no clear way to check stuff. Um, 
So once that copy file ranges syscall was fixed, then the check for, uh, in, it's now checks if it gets a directory descriptor. So what about send file? Does it check that it doesn't get a directory descriptor? No one looked at it, no one made sure. Um, th that's a shame that you only fix one syscall, but you can't fix all of them. You, your work doesn't get reused in the kernel, so if you fix one specific spot, it doesn't mean that you fixed all other spots that might have the same problem. Uh, and we do want it to happen. We have a bunch of system calls that may take regular files but can't take directories, and all of them should have the check. And all of them should have tons of other checks that aren't there right now. We can whack moles one by one when we find stuff, but that's not a good way to keep developing and going on. Uh, user space has its own problems with this model because we don't expose anything standard from the kernel. We don't say what the kernel should be providing to user space. So we have different uh, user space libraries. Uh, GLPC has its own system call or its own API implementation. QMU has one, uh, strace, LTTNG, the various fuzzers we use. Each of them has a library that describes how the system calls and how IOCTLs look, and each of them has uh, errors and mistakes, and it's broken and it might be, ch might be uh, relevant to one specific kernel version. So we have 10 implementations and all, I don't know 10. We have a bunch of implementations and each of them is wrong in its own way. Uh, instead of having one that's correct and we know to work, we have a bunch that are broken. Uh, we also have documentation, which is pretty good right now. We have man pages, which are great for development. They, um, I think they are good for about, I wrote 8020, but I really think it's 955 where they're good for 95% of the cases. So if you're just writing code, uh, need to look at man page for reference, you look and it gives you exactly what you need, you go happily and you keep writing the code. Uh, the problem is with the other 5% uh, use case or 5% undocumented use case that are missing there. Uh, and those missing bits are huge. So, I mean, you'd ideally want to see for the open syscall, for example, all possible combinations of parameters and what they are supposed to return to user space. So if you pass all create and all directory together, it's supposed to return uh, whatever return value. It's supposed to be specified somewhere. Uh, so man pages are really just scratching the surface. They're sort of like summary briefing versus contract. So you know sort of what everything does, but you don't know what, how stuff works exactly. Uh, so we need sort of a contract between user space and kernel space to say what uh, the kernel will do given a request from user space. Right now the, the contract is in the form of kernel code. Um, so if you want to know what happens if you pass all directory and all create, you have to go poke at the kernel code and see what it does. Uh, this is all subject to change. Maybe not intentionally, but someone could change it. Linus might not notice the change and bam, it does something different altogether. So it's not really a contract if there's no one enforcing it. There's no um, kernel ABI police to come chase you down if you broke the current, if you broke the contract and the user space is breaking. So anyone can modify it as, it's, as much as he wants. Uh, so it's not really a contract. It's not being enforced by anything. <coughs> uh, so what I'm hoping we could do, I describe a few issues that I'm hoping we could eliminate with one uh, solution. Uh, we want to make sure we don't break uh, user space when we upgrade our kernel. Um, we want to make sure that user space that was written 10 years ago will still run on recent kernels. Uh, we want to make sure that user space interacts correctly with the kernel by telling user space exactly what it can expect the kernel to do, exactly what the kernel would perform when given a certain uh, system call and a certain set of flags. Uh, we also want to document things. It's nice when we have something that Users can review uh, something that can be used in research that specifies exactly uh, what the user space might expect from the kernel. And we can also reuse here. Um, Linus said that all bugs are shallow given enough eyeballs, or the other way around. Uh, so we basically have a bunch of forked implementations that try to do the same thing, and each of them gets small set, like not too many eyeballs. And I think that if we unify everything into a single project, it will get more eyeballs. Uh, we'll, be we'll be finding bugs more easily. Um, well, the question is how would that contract look like? Uh, that's a good question. We want it to be human readable on the one end. We want to be able to read it just like man pages, which would be useful. 
But on the other hand, we want it to be machine readable, so we can use it in our user space libraries and we can use it in the kernel. Um, but we only want to write it once. We don't want to have um, parallel implementation and try to update both of them. So I'm hoping we could have some sort of format and have uh, conversion tools, either to, from human to machine or machine to human. Um, so I started looking at what Syscala provides. Uh, Syscala is a pretty intelligent uh, coverage-based uh, system called Fuzzer. Um, it does coverage based on how deep it gets into the code. It figures out um, what code paths it poked, and then it will try to mutate the input to trigger more, co more code paths. And to do that, it has a pretty extensive description of system calls uh, in machine-readable format. Uh, so I started using that and tried to turn it into um, something we can use in the kernel. Uh, so to use it in the kernel, I wanted to hook into the API path. So for now, I want to look at system calls and octals. I want to look at when things go in. I want to look at the parameters that go in the system calls and octals. And I want to look on the way out what the actual code returned and make sure it matches what uh, our API said it could return. Uh, when stuff go in, we can verify the parameters. So for example, if our open syscall doesn't allow passing no directory and no create, we can block it at that point, even without having it get into the actual uh, system call code, even without going to, to, the, to the VFS layer. We can already stop that at the um, kernel ABI verification level. In user space, we could basically have our uh, version of sort of libc. Um, but make it usable for other projects to rely on, uh, have, the, have the code be simple so uh, Trinity and Syscaller could switch to that, so uh, S3 shouldn't, be, shouldn't need to implement its own um, libraries. Uh, I'm pretty sure they could have done it now, just no one pushed that way. Um, I think that if we push it away and we have a uh, sort of kernel BI that's forced on the kernel side, um, the user space would prefer to use that rather than keep chasing new kernel versions and updating it with new APIs. Uh, so for example, every time we add a system call to the kernel, someone has to go in the, into the Trinity fuzzer and add it into their library, someone has to go to the syscaller and add it into their library, libc, and so on. And this is a recipe for disaster since some of them will get it wrong. This would mean that if we fix one place, uh, everything else is fixed as well. So if we find that Splice can take event of this, for example, and we add a check that says um, Splice, that this sort of file descriptor can only be a regular file, this will also apply to other different syscalls that have the same problem. So if we fix Splice, we may fix send file and the same go. And same thing applies to user space. If one user space application um, finds something wrong with the ABI and fixes it, it would fix everything for um, the rest of the applications. And if one application adds a new system call that was added in a new kernel release, every other application will get to use that syscall free of charge. It will also mean that we'll detect breakage faster because instead of having random applications break, uh, all of them will either be broken or working. So we won't have one out of 20 applications break given the change in the kernel. Either all of them break or none of them will break. Um, so the stable and the LTS kernel tree are uh, um, I'm hoping to cure us of needing them in the future, at least the LTS tree. Because uh, right now we promise that we won't break the kernel and that's our biggest guarantee and we'll never break the user space applications. And yet we have stable and long-term stable kernel trees, which is basically an admission saying that we suck at not breaking your code. Um, I think that if we provide the kernel API tree, we could at least give vendors, we could give distro some sort of guarantee saying, look, we didn't break your code this time, everything looks fine. Um, um, it's not just the user space, you don't want to break, you also don't want to break your, break your drivers. If your hardware doesn't work and your user space works, it's, uh, it's not really useful. So it's one part of the problem, not the whole part. I, I also didn't reference um, SysFS and ProcFS, which are also ABI. This is just way beyond the scope. I mean, this is so, uh, the, the ABI itself is so huge and we can't really address all of it in one go. It's, yeah, I agree that this is part of the problem. Uh, I, I just think that if we address the core things, it 
it will give the user space, it will give distros, it will give user space more guarantees that uh, we didn't break the things this time. And hopefully Android, for example, instead of using LTS kernels, would now use regular stable kernels because they're more confident that upgrading between stable kernels will now work and not horribly break things. Um. Uh, th there is another reason because you're speaking about Android and as Greg showed, uh, uh, they have tons of patches and one other reason for using st uh, stable or LTS kernels is to be able to easily reapply your local patches on top of uh, a code that does not change too much. Uh, yeah, I have a bunch of reasons not doing that. I'm hoping it will eliminate one of the reasons, one of the more bigger reasons. I'm not saying that it's everything. Um, we still have problems with performance regressions or stuff like that, uh, which, we don't which we don't exactly address here, but I'm hoping it's just another guarantee. Uh, ideally, we'd be able to say everyone should just use mainline. Let's just drop stable kernel trees because we never break anything, right? Um, but that's not the case. We try not to break, but we do break stuff often. Um, so I'm hoping that at least we could move uh, users from the LTS kernels into regular stable, ker stable kernels if they more confident that we don't break stuff too often. It also means that users will get to upgrade more often, and upgrades are good. Um, just for the sake of security updates even. People are stuck at the old kernel and they're afraid to upgrade because everything works for them. So they don't see a reason to upgrade. And a bunch of times when they do end up upgrading, stuff break. The system doesn't boot, there's a new code that's broken. It takes a very small bug in the kernel to completely kill a system. So they just don't want to take the risk without enough guarantees saying that, hey, we didn't actually break stuff this time. Um, this has a bunch of security implications. You know, it me we have a bunch of um, CVs or not CV security issues that are a result of the ABI not behaving the way that it was designed to behave. So when someone wrote um, a system call, it had an idea of how the system call should work but it didn't think about the different ways that system call could be exploited to do things that it shouldn't have been doing. Um, and if you get the kernel to do stuff that it wasn't planning on doing, it's usually bad because you lost the system at that point. So I'm hoping if we have more eyes looking at the same code, uh, we'll have less of those paths available. Uh, it also means that Security fix in one project applies to the other projects, and it will result in less CVs, I'm hoping, or less security issues. I mean, even if you don't look at the whole CV issue. Um, I really feel that uh, the kernel BI is the number one source for security issues, um, just because this is the gateway for user space to get into the kernel, and it's really implemented poorly. It's the, the gatekeeper really doesn't do its job over there. Um, as I mentioned a couple of slides before, the gatekeeper is basically that person who's supposed to look at other syscalls and figure out what sort of checks it should do and what sort of documentation it should write. Uh, and that thing is in the standard process. It gets barely any reviews. Like for example, the copy file range problem was around for about a year. So around the, for between November 2015 and December 2016, anyone could call it with a um, directory descriptor and stuff would go wrong. No one noticed. This is really lack of review, but um, we also need more tools in place to catch those things. Something like this could also be used uh, not just by user space and kernel space. If we tell, if we provide a document saying this is what the kernel does given these inputs, it's useful in a bunch of other scenarios. Um, so the example here is what's common between a nuclear power plant and an Android kernel on your phone. And both of them want to get uh, the things they need, not more, not less. They both need to know what they're getting, and they both need to disable things they don't want to be in the kernel. And right now, we can't provide that. We can't tell them, you need these five functions, you need to enable these 10 syscalls. We don't have that ability right now, so they're enabling everything, which means that they're vulnerable to security issues that they might, they might not even consider that this, the recent issues where uh, you could do attacks on floppy drives for uh, cloud images. That's, why would anyone enable a floppy drive in the cloud? No one knows. But if we had the kernel ABI and we would be able to block those accesses, we would be able to say, yeah, we don't allow access to any uh, device drivers 
from a user space, it would have blocked those attacks. It will also make security reviews easier. Um, you would receive a document saying exactly what files, what objects, what device drivers you can access given the set of rules. It'll be easy to write something to check whether it fits the scenario or not. Uh, and that's why you can easily restrict access control. Um, so what's the tricky part in getting all of this done? Uh, first is figuring out how the format will look like. Uh, I've been toying with a few options, but I don't really have anything to show. I've tried the syscaller format. Uh, I tried something that looks like um, XML, that easy to parse. Um, people don't like XML in the kernel, so that quickly died. Uh, I'm not really sure how to make it both machine readable and human readable and make the conversion easy. Uh, I, I want the human readable site to be not worse than man pages. I want to incorporate the content of man pages into that format, hopefully. Um, and I want to make the machine readable site be able to generate in few languages. I want it to be able to turn into C headers. I want it to be usable in Go. I want it to be usable in whatever other language user space uses. Uh, we also need someone to document all these things. We have tons of syscalls, we have tons of yoctals, we have tons of uh, sysfs files, we have tons of everything, and uh, no one's really sure how that all works. Um, we know how the basic works, but we don't know all the details about those things. Uh, and just the sheer amount of data that needs to be processed here is um, incredible. So I've started working on uh, a few of the memory functions in a memory management subsystem and a few of the uh, timer functions, just because they're easy, uh, comparably easy to uh, address. I'll hopefully, hopefully I'll have patches in the next week or two. I already have a few, um, two series of sent to LKML if you want to review the code so far. Um, but I'll send these out hopefully in a week or two, just to get more input from people. Uh, but we need someone to do the rest of the work. I, I don't expect it to be done on day one. I think that we can start with a limited set of syscalls we verify, and then let people add stuff in as we go. Uh, we also need someone to test it out. Um, there's a reason that we find bugs only at the end users. Um, just we, we just don't have the right tools to test these things. We have the LTP, we have case self test, we have tons of tools, but we don't really have a real reliable way to make sure that uh, we, we have everything covered. So we need to figure out a way to let user space end up with the code and have user space actually exercise. Um, our new code, but we don't, want the, we don't want the code to hurt them. So if we decided for the open syscall that we're gonna block our directory and our create, and we force that now, we may find a user space in the world that relied on that, those flags to actually create a directory. And now that user space is broken. And as Linux doesn't like us to break user space, it's gonna be upset and revert this whole patch set and throw it away. So we don't really want that to happen. So we need to figure out sort of a common, like a simple way to do allow users to test it, but not force it on all of them. Uh, we could make it a config option, which is a um, simple idea, but that's not gonna work because no one is gonna enable that. No distro is gonna enable that config option, it's just gonna sit in the sand and rot. Uh, so we need to find a way to do that uh, in a nice way to allow users to test it. Um, now I left a bunch of room for questions because that's usually what happens. Uh, that seems like a rather massive job. Have you found anyone willing to sponsor a, a bigger framework around it? Or? I'm hoping to start small with this, just as I said, just a few system calls. Uh, I feel that once it gets in the kernel, if it gets in the kernel, uh, we could enforce um, people who touch the API to change it. So I don't feel it's all gonna be a one-man job. I just need to get the foot in. And once the foot is in, we can make people change this because it's gonna be part of the documentation versus part of the code. So you can ask people to update the documentation if they touch a syscall. Um, the few projects offer support trying to uh, get the basic layout of the ABI, so to parse the binary, uh, ELF, the VM Linux, just to get the ABI stuff in, to get those things in place. But um, I, I, I'm not sure how we're gonna do the parsing of the actual flags or what the combination of flags or the combination of parameters yet, and that's gonna be lots of work. Uh, so there's definitely interested from the people who are in, uh, who are looking into safety critical usage uh, of Linux because that's one of their pain points. 
So once we, we get a foot in on that, I think those people will uh, provide at least some power uh, to, to, to help with that. As they, they already look into that, but they have no solution either, so I think we can... Uh, so it's something like this makes sense, where I get it working for a few system calls and then ask people... Yeah. Do you wanna? Yeah. And, and, and so what I expect from them, because they... Um, the current way how they do it is uh, uh, restricting the number of, of usable system calls anyway to a minimal subset um, in order to make auditing easier and testing easier. So, and then they, they would start from there and get their minimal subset documented with, because that makes their augmentation on the safety cases le uh, way easier. Right now, it's um, pretty tough to do that. <laughs> Do they have some sort of um, analysis that they don't say calls already, or they just disable says calls at both? Uh, it's it, what they have is basically the, the the restricted set, and they did some kind of of structured analysis, so some of that information can certainly be reused. Mm. That could be useful. Um, You're going to be in Prague? No. Too much travel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It, it could be useful if anyone did something similar and has some documentation of ABIs and something more than man pages provide because man pages I can rip off. Uh, something that um, describes the interaction between different parameters, even if it's just for a specific system call, uh, just to get stuff going. If someone looked at, I don't know, the read system call and knows exactly what happens given different combinations of uh, different file descriptors, different size parameters, different addresses, um, it could be awesome if you'll send it my way. It could be one of the first system calls we're going to enforce this thing on. Uh, if not, as I said, I'm going to start digging into the memory management and the um, timer stuff. Uh, here is it. Hmm? Michael. Wait, right, the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> sneak, sneak. <laughs> yes. No, um, as I was saying, uh, just real quick, uh, we're, one of the talks we were talking about before, actually at Plumbers, was adding system calls for, uh, like, you know, BPF and stuff like that. So maybe we could talk with you, because mm -hmm. we want to make sure we do it right. As for my last talk, I wanted, wanted to, had a lot of inconsistencies with my stuff, and I can't change it because, you know, user space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you are the new syscall, I'd be also happy to work with you. That's probably the, the easiest stage to get this thing going. Yeah, let's do it. So um, you were talking about the open flags and how their interactions are not well documented. And I realize that is a quite bad problem. Uh, and maybe one day I'll get some time to look at it. But um, I realized a while back there was the same problem with the mount system call, that the, the interactions of flags were not well documented. And I did actually turn around and fix that with quite some detail. You might find interesting, if you want an example to work with, the mount man page might be useful for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll, I'll look at mount. I, mount. I thought it's actually going to be one of the harder... It, it probably is. <laughs> but at least it, it's, it's one example of how um, at least I've attempted to resolve that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking that uh, instead of uh, trying to invent a new format to represent all this, maybe it would be nice to start to improve the main pages themselves because there is already a lot of information there, but as you pointed out, uh, it's not complete. Some combinations are not documented, and maybe we should start thinking about uh, maybe adding an advanced section uh, in these main pages uh, to document all the boring stuff, uh, the stuff that does not interest uh, most people, but those who want to dig into the details can get there. Otherwise, you will have a new inconsistency problem. You will have some differences between uh, certain main pages and this document as well. What I'm worried is that if we extend main pages too much, they're going to be way too big. We're going to be sending everyone way too much data just because most it, it's the, the 80 20 rule. We're going to be providing users about five times more data that they don't actually need inside that man page. I, I disagree. I develop in user land. I rely a lot on these calls and I. Um, 
Sometimes I'm a bit borderline. I observe, I say, yes, it's working exactly like I need. That's perfect. But um, uh, I never know if it's just an accident or uh, if it's by design or by uh, choice. And usually it's more uh, a matter of common sense because the person who implemented the syscall uh, implemented what made sense for her. And uh, if I'm using the same syscall, it's probable that I have the same needs. But uh, for a user land developer, it's very important to have uh, as much de detail as possible on what a syscall does. Yeah, I definitely think this should be integrated in some way. I just don't think it should be the default to send all that uh, stuff up. There should be references, I think. Just because there's so much useless, useless information, there's going to be a, that, um, that it's, most... It's not useless uh, if, uh, if there is a need to document them. I just think main pages are more of the reference for day-to-day um, -day usage for the regular programmer that needs... For some people, it's day-to-day -day usage. <laughs> Every now and then I get one people come along and like, what is this saying? <laughs> Boom. Um, maybe a way to find a common ground between um, what you're saying and what Willie is saying uh, will be to try and um, and uh, you know define um, the users um, the syscalls in you know the a format like the one you were talking about I don't know how to the syscaller format and uh, add you know commands and those commands will be well the man page, and then generate, regenerate the man page, you know, from the union of the formal description of the Cisco and the command, the command that you know generate the man page. So, at, so you have at one single place, um, you know, the formal description of the types of uh, the syscalls and um, their you know documentation, and so you can generate whatever you want from, from there. So that will be... Yeah, ideally the information will be integrated. I don't want to lose what main pages have, I'm not saying. Yeah. I think it's very relevant. I do want to keep it as part of this. So, so that will be the first thing. And then the second thing I'm not, you know, really, I'm a bit confused about is, um, you know, what do you mean by enforce? I, I think you started to, you know, talk about that briefly. Um, I guess there are, like, at least a mode which is a runtime mode, right? Yep. You know, like at runtime, the kernel went, you know, yep. when it... It basically checks the flags and yeah. if, the if the flags don't match what the syscall expects, if the combination of flags or the combination of parameters or anything else, or the type of the file descriptor doesn't match what the system call expects, it would block it right there without actually going to the actual syscall. And the That's the runtime part. Yeah. But do you envision something, uh, you know, statically, not at runtime, like, for instance, when, uh, I don't know, when someone submits a patch uh, to, you know, the syscalls or whatever, uh, you know, so that there would be a, a, a tool that would, and, you know, um, say, you know, like, enforce that, you know, the change makes it uh, still compatible with. Ideal, I'm not going to say no, it's just... No, 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 I mean, yeah, but what's in right? your mind? Uh, yeah, the deal is going to be great. If we have more static analyzers and uh, runtime mode, it's going to be awesome. So someone needs to write it and someone it needs to get there. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we discussed earlier, uh, last year, I think, we, we discussed that, why we want to have that in a machine-readable re form, because that opens up... Uh, 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 chances for uh, doing research on static analyzers for that type of thing. They do not exist today, but they only can exist if we have actually parsable data and reliable data. So you can't do verification on um, prosa uh, descriptions in man pages. That doesn't, simply doesn't work. I mean, the, the, the man page language is pretty precise, but it's hard to translate into rules. Yeah, I'm thinking we could generate man pages based on this format, hopefully. I'm yeah. not saying we're going to do the other way around. Hopefully we'll, we'll have enough information in the format to generate man pages. So, and generate machine readable code as well. Yeah. So, so ideally, we, 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 when you start uh, doing the first, uh, th the first uh, documentation of, of a syscall, is you drag in the existing man page immediately mm -hmm. and then 
uh, let Michael know about it, and maybe Michael is willing to carry that documentation completely. And you just have, uh, so, so it's, it's stored in one single place. I, I mean, whatever. Uh, but then you have both uh, the prosa text uh, explaining it, which is the reference uh, for the daily use programmers, and then you have the, the, extra, uh, the extra bits, machine readable for tools, fuzz, uh, fuzzers, verification tools, and whatever the hell. Yeah, that's, that's probably the ideal outcome of it. Yeah, if, if Michael's final thoughts, then, I mean, we could work on how it's supposed to look like and then have it built binary machine readable code, have it built man pages, have it built whatever you want, have it write books for us. Um, I just need to find that format that's easy for everyone to work with. No one will have too many objections regard to. It's been a bit tricky so far. Um, yeah, but on the other hand, if you, if you lose, you use, start using one of the, I mean, there are not that many options. You have some of the extensible uh, description, description formats, whatever, uh, JSON, XML, what the hell. Um, choose one, start off there, and converting them into a different format shouldn't be the hell of, of a job right. if, it, if it starts out. Because when you try to, to get people agreeing on the format now, you're going to have bike shed discussions for the next two years. So just start, make a starting point, select one which you think fits, and start from there. If it turns out after half a year it doesn't do the job and there's a better uh, uh, suitable one, then as long as it's machine readable, you can convert formats today. That's not, not, really, not really the problem point. Right. Just pick one. Right, get over it, people will get used to it, or if they are annoyed enough, they will provide you uh, the conversion okay. script and, and show you how their format is way better. Yep. But uh, Thomas, I still disagree with uh, your differentiation between uh, everyday user and uh, advanced usage like uh, Syscaller because uh, the presentation started about not breaking user space, and uh, user space is basically what results of everyday use usage. So uh, in my opinion, we absolutely need to have uh, all the details of the implementation properly documented for everyday users. Yeah. Hey? No. We broke it. Not yet. No, that's an orthogonal issue. That's not mutually exclusive. I mean, you can have more detailed uh, main pages that way. If that makes sense for the vast majority of programmers is a different question. So you can have main pages as we have today for Joe user. You have, can have the expert man pages with the extra comment stuff filled in. And, but that's a question. Uh, once we we have we start off on the on the formal definition, and you have extra comments fields for your formal definition points, then you can decide what to extract into a main page and what not. So, I mean, the formal description only works. Uh, you can only work on a formal description if you actually add comments to it. The formal description uh, itself, the, the machine-readable part of it, is what the, the, the fuzzer tools or any other verification tools can use to generate automatically a code which lets you verify or lets you test the assumptions which are documented there. So, but the amount of information you put into the comments and then extract into whatever uh, man page uh, uh, regular and man page experts and man page superman. That's uh, just a matter of decision and uh, taste and whatever. So yes, 
we will need to have comments along with the, with the formal specifications, otherwise it's hard to read for, for humans. Time for a coffee break. <laughs> Thank you very much.